This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Every creator should try a Storyblocks membership. They make it easy for you to bring all your stories to life without having to worry about adding extra time, a budget, or resources you don't have. Storyblocks is an ever-growing library of over 1 million high-quality, royalty-free stock assets, including 4K footage, music, images, and more. You can even use Storyblocks if you're a member of a large creative team or marketing agency, royalty-free free subscriptions are possible learn more and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test once again that's storyblocks.com slash only a test hey let's start the show for thursday march 18th 2021 welcome to this is only a test the official podcast of tested dot com Hello, hello, good morning, and welcome to the show this week. I'm Norm. I got a coffee in my hand. I've just woken up because it is early Thursday morning. Uh, we're recording this a little bit late for reasons that will soon be clear, but I am joined today by Kishore Hari. Hey, it's still it's still March. It's still it, it's the 13th March. month of March. <laughs> It, wait, 367 days of March. Yes, that's true. Oh, my God. I, I just got what you're putting out there and broadcasting from what looks like what looks like uh, the Mars <gasps> is Will Smith. That's Mars. <laughs> hey, Will. Hey, Norm, how's it going? It, the air's real thin here. So I and it's cold when I'm high and warm when I'm low. So I'm, I, my face is right off the off the ground. <gasps> there are drones and robots and nuclear power stations on Mars, all all yeah. things that we as humanity have sent up there, out there, and landed. I'm successfully. very unhappy with the lack of scientific accuracy in that bit. Look, I, I <laughs> look. I didn't spend two hours figuring out how long I'd have to hold my breath for. I'm I'm sorry, Kishore. <laughs> how are you guys doing? How are you guys doing this uh, this Thursday morning? I'm sorry to, to our schedules aligned. I mean, obviously not with Jeremy, but uh, so we record this week and. You know, I'm actually kind of glad that we postponed the recording um, by half a day because some news has broke already this morning that we can talk about. But uh, how are you guys doing? Man, I was up until five o'clock in the morning watching the Snyder Cut, and um, I, I just I couldn't wait to engage with that content. I was ready to go. I've been waiting for it for months. You know me. Hashtag release the Snyder Cut for for life. So this is this is like my Super Bowl and Christmas. And and Hanukkah all rolled up into one fabulous day, Norm. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm glad Will's going to take the heat for once on uh, <laughs> uh, how, how I feel about the Snyder Cut. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks. This is Bioware's fault. You know, if they oh. hadn't changed the ending of Mass Effect Three, fans would not feel so empowered. They well, started well, you, all of this. You, you could you could also say it's Richard Donner's fault. You could say you could say it's uh, Ridley Scott's fault, but we'll get to that. That's not even our top story uh, this week. But yeah, it is. Uh, it's something that did happen. The Snyder Cut was released, and I I did go to bed four hours ago. Uh, with uh, I I think I dreamt up like tweets that I sent snarky tweets about the Snyder Cut, and I woke up not remembering which ones I sent and which ones I didn't send. That's not healthy, man. That's, no, I'm just going to say it right now. <laughs> Don't hold grudges. Don't hold <laughs> grudges in life. If it's too short. It's not worth it. Uh, but good to see you both. Good to see you both, Will, uh, Will and it's Kishore. Good to see you, Norm. Um, you know what? We're, we're going to be a little bit short on time this week because we have a lot to do. So I think uh, I'm going to roll right into, once I find the musical cue. Yes, let's roll right into a top story this week. story this week you know among the uh maker community and even the 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 tech community there was one new story that got quite of a bit attention uh, and it's a developing story things that have changed since news broke about what happened uh, over last the past weekend Uh, but it definitely is very relevant in our spheres um we at test we've been big fans of the the cricket system of 
uh, uh, vinyl cutters, of plotters and vinyl cutters for a long time. Uh, one of the things that we always tell people when they ask us about, you know, well, should I get a laser cutter? Or, you know, what kind of CNC type tool? Will, do you remember the, one of the very first things we did at Tested was a whole video series, this whole segment on the idea of CNC. Remember CNC? You mean computer network control? Numerical control. Damn it. Dude, we had a whole so on-screen graphic so and everything. Computer? It's been 10 years. It's Numerical. been a long time. Control. Uh, but the whole idea that, you know, you, you, even then, 10 years ago, it was not a new technology. The idea that you can turn um, digital bits to, uh, to contr- using, you know, off-the-shelf stepper motors, essentially, to create plotters that are in two dimensions or three dimensions. And essentially, it's how, like, uh, the, the, the first 3D printers, consumer 3D printers work, right? The idea that a, a maker bot could could take g code and and uh you know convert uh, create a work path in this case for a uh, 3d printer you know the extrusion head of a nozzle um and 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 very precisely you know draw out a three-dimensional shape plotters have been doing that forever and the what you know uh, back then we would just call it the the, uh, the, the the scrapbooking and craft world but all of that mm-hmm. you know has, has been made way more accessible and you know my point was that when people ask, should I get a laser cutter? Yeah, laser cutters are wonderful and super powerful. And so are CNC machines, you know, for that matter. But to get into that mindset of turning planar forms into three-dimensional shapes or it's working with vectors, a plotter is one of the easiest ways to get into that. And it's all the same principles. And a vinyl cutter, like one made by uh, the Cricut, like the Cricut Maker was for, for us, one of our favorite ones for so long. You could cut fabric, you could cut styrene, you can even cut uh, thin sheets of balsa, you know, without having to run a, a, a laser in your own house. I, I think you're glossing over the the main use of the cricket in the in the world we operate in, at least uh, the world I operate in, like the cosplay community. And by no means am I like a significant cosplay maker, but the cricket maker was able to cut foam. Um, Mm -hmm. and, um, and like relatively thin, thin sheets of foam, but like that made, um, a foam coming a much more automated, precise operation. And when you're pattering helmets and other sort of curved surfaces, it was a really useful tool and like much more affordable than the, the kind of industrial, uh, applications out there because the Cricut maker is only around like 400 bucks. I mean, I have one. Um, and uh, compared to like the over a thousand dollar machines that had been out there for the more kind of uh, professional operations out there. So it was sort of a democratized tool that has been around forever. That was just that started getting added to the cosplay community a few years ago. And for a long time, it was the only one that could really cut foam well uh, at, for that type of uh, uh, hardware. And a huge advocates among our friends in the cosplay and maker community, and we're huge advocates of it as well. And I say were because last week they made this big announcement, you know, uh, updates to their software, but more importantly, updates to their policy, which is that previously to use the device, the, their software is essentially, it's, you know, it's app based, you can run it on PC or, or, or a tablet, but you actually send your files through a web server to get processed, to turn vectors into the the computer code that, that then it reads back and you Bluetooth over to the vinyl cutter. And they cap the uploads to 20 uploads per month unless you started paying for a subscription fee, which is a... How did people react to that? It seems like they probably love that, right? That's they like they did thing. not. They did not love it. I, I think. Oh. The, yes, the, the response was strong. Did uh, they try was... to couch it as like a good thing? Were they like, "Hey, we have great, uh, we have a great uh, news for the for the platform. We're going to roll out some amazing new features." And oh, by the way, only twenty minutes a month. You know, I, I think <laughs> they they couched it with your typical. Uh, they have. Uh, regular incurred costs with running their servers and updating their software. And this is like the, an evolution mm. of their, their platform. And, and, you know, nowhere did they mention that they had an impending IPO that, you know, this may, Weird. Have, but this might be impacting. Uh, so this, this is, this isn't the first time they've behaved badly, right? Like this is back in the old days, they were on Cory Doctorow's bad list for years because they were the place that would only let you cut thing designs that they sold you. They wouldn't let you. Well, they used to be a company that had like cartridges 
So it mm-hmm. was like mm-hmm. cooked into the machine, the designs that you could cut. Um, but that was more of like a hardware limitation. So like when you were purchasing the device, you kind of knew what you were getting into. So it was a little mm-hmm. bit of like the inkjet printer of of hobby craft makers in the sense that like they would get you on the, the cartridge side of things. Um, I think what really stung about this cricket thing is even though they haven't really made an emphasis of the cosplay community, I think there is this notion that you're buying this hardware that wasn't mm-hmm. locked to any sort of subscription or upload. It had freaking garbage software. The software is still pretty bad. Hey, do you guys um, remember that time that, you know, on a laser cutter software or a vinyl cutter software that you got your first cut absolutely right and laid out perfectly and it just worked awesome that first time through? <laughs> yeah, because that never happens, right? So this idea of limiting the potential uploads, I think, was one of the consequences of uh, it, like the effect that it had on the community was like, hey, you know, I do a lot of trial and error stuff. And so 20 uploads is basically limiting me down to just doing like one thing uh, before yeah. I run out of uh, uh, bandwidth. And so I think the pushback wasn't just around the subscription idea, but the number that they attached to it was also the big problem. Yeah. Because it would have basically for a lot of people that were really into cosplay and making it was going to turn their thing into a brick uh if they didn't uh up for the subscription i mean yeah yeah oh anytime you have a hardware product that you're like oh instead of maintaining the base level functionality that you sold the device with as the free tier and then adding like if they had just rolled this out and said hey you know the processing will be will will be better we'll give you some new tools or something like that if you pay it pony up for the sub then that's a different situation. But saying, hey, this thing that you bought is now almost useless for most people. Like like, like when I laser cut birthday cards for people, it's always at least four or five cuts per card. Not even because I have trouble lining it up or anything, but because I do complicated stuff with multiple layers. And that's, if each of those counts as a cut, then then that's like... And, and to be clear, four, it was an upload, yeah. right? It was an upload limitation, like how many times. And so if you're doing tweaks and... And, and you could do the tweaks in the software itself. So they're they're getting people more relied on their mm-hmm. software, which is not, you know, it's a mismatch between, I think, how people actually use the device. And people do trial and error on their desktop, on, on their vector design program of their choice using, you know, using keyboard and mouse shortcuts because it's just faster. Uh, and and they, you think about, you know, what, is there a number that could have made their users happier? Could they have bumped it to, to 50 or you know, what, what, what would have been a, the happy no. compromise? But I think that people are mostly disgruntled because it felt like a bait and switch. It felt like yeah. taking back. It didn't back, feel like one. It is oh, one. And, 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 you know, the, you know, so the, the evolution of the story is that the policy was reversed. So anyone who has, who bought a machine gets the full upload uh, they did say that you will need to absolutely re- you know, register your hardware to your user account. And the unlimited uploads is only extends to legacy purchases and machines that were bought and registered up until the end of this calendar year, uh, December 2021. So, you know, clearly they still want to move with the subscription model going forward. Uh, and that won't be a problem for me. Now. <laughs> and, yeah, and and yeah, there are a lot of a lot of people who are looking for alternatives. You know, in in that type in that in in that vinyl cutter potter world, there are there's a silhouette cameo that's been around for a long time. Brother has a machine, U.S. Cutter has a machine, and so you know it, it's getting people to look at machines that can work completely offline. And we're no strangers to. I mean, I, I don't want to just spend too much time on cricket because this is something that you know they hopefully have time to to reverse they did reverse this initial announcement but it does beg the the deeper conversation about um, these devices how much of it you own what the kind of user policies are and also devices that are connected to the cloud you know the the kind of fear that i know every glowforge owner still has is you know when when will be that day uh that uh you know, the, the service becomes unusable or the service goes away, the cloud-based processing of that service. And will there be someone in the community to pick up those reins uh, and, and make that part free? Because, you know, even even now we see, to use Glowforge as an example, you know, the experience hasn't changed for someone who bought a machine and got it three, four years ago. 
Uh, but there's there's a subscription account that they they offer now for, and that gets you in front of the queue for processing the, the your your laser cutter. So there are things that uh, that they're adding because they need to have that incremental revenue, and uh, they do have recurring costs on their server side. I'm sensitive to the fact that these companies are fundamentally hardware companies, like like just looking at their base business model. And then somewhere along the line, they're trying to build software to pair service. with their hardware. Service like, businesses. Yeah. These services. Yeah, I was going to say like custom software that really like poses as a service. And I think that's a mismatch of uh, of talent and scope and mission that is showing up in the, these products. I'm sensitive to like the costs that are incurred because of this. I think we just want, like, I'll just speak for myself. I, I just want when I buy a piece of hardware to understand what I'm buying into uh, up front. So I actually have less of a problem with Cricket saying like, hey, after the end of 2021, if you buy a maker, you pretty much have to get a subscription to use this thing. Um, that's fine. It's up front. I'm not going to buy it at that point, but at least it's up front and there um, out in the open. Uh, I just think if we can get to a place, even though if it'll be jankier, where the focus is on developing uh, the the hardware innovation uh, and partnering with groups to make a more open source version of the software that runs on these platforms, that's going to be better for the user community. And frankly, it might cut down on costs for some of these companies in the development of these these service packages. I mean, that, that happened in the 3D printer space, the the mm-hmm. open source, like when, when the MakerBot launched a consumer printer in 2010, 2009, whenever that was, the software was bad. It was just tragic because it, I mean, it was, it was ports of software that was designed for high end CNC mills and stuff like that. And then a, a, over as time elapsed, uh, people built alternatives and, and now the open source community is building the best 3D printer software that's out there. And it's, it's what you want on your 3D printer. So yeah it's it's uh, i think it's it's, a, it's it's also about the the scope of ambition for these companies you know if the company was more like you know if, again from the 3d printing world like Prusa industries right joseph Prusa's company like they are purely hardware based they iterate a lot but they think you know they believe that they the customer base is there's still a lot of room to grow their market without having to charge subscriptions because there's you know there are millions and millions of people out there without a 3d printer and they believe that Growing that message of what you can do with a 3D printer and getting people to buy the hardware, even if the margins are not going to be as high as if they ran a subscription service, that's a solid foundation to run a business. But if the ambition is to satisfy, you know, a hundred million IPO or you know, a a, a, yeah, a shareholders, a, a big shareholders in a, in a in a big business, right? Hardware is really tough. Um, because even if you have a very successful product, there's tough, stiff competition, and also the market may not sustain it, right? That type of growth, you have to be kind of happy with what type of business you're in. And I think, you know, even companies like MakerBot felt that. There's a lot of rush with the, the, the first couple generations, and then a lot of competition, and uh, and the market didn't grow. And I mean, completely different, like VR, I think has also felt that too, right? A lot of people got in real early and then it's hard to ask uh, consumers, even a hardcore fan base to buy new hardware every year and spend three to four hundred dollars on it to to keep a hardware business going. And hardware is where R&D is expensive. It's where manufacturing and uh, supply chain stuff is very expensive. Um, and there's, uh, you know, it, it, it's you can't have a a, a, a billion dollar business um, running pure hardware that way or it's very difficult to. At this this is the Gartner hype cycle, right? Yeah, yeah, but um, it's way worse for hardware. Yep, absolutely. So you know, uh, I, I'm glad that for current owners that palsy is rolled back. I'm glad that it's very clear now. I think awareness of it is why we're talking about it still right now because these machines are what people are still looking for. You know, I'm still a big advocate of this kind of home, you know, uh, CNC plotter, CNC vinyl cutter. I think it's super powerful, uh, but um, you know, we'll be looking at other options as well and tr- giving people recommendations. Honestly, after the, after the, um, you, you, this is their second strike as far as I'm concerned, right? Like they did with the, with the DMCAing people who were trying to, to hack the machines to run 
software that they didn't sell. Um, I'm I'm not interested. I was looking at vinyl cutters, and I'm not interested in Cricut anymore. One of the workarounds that I saw on uh, Reddit is that you could upload unlimited uh, fonts still, and there's web-based software to turn any SVG you design uh, into a font. <laughs> so you then just upload your font. That's your you know your holiday card greeting or whatever it is that you're making. This won't be the last time this comes up. Every year or two, there's a version of this story that comes up. It's just a different piece of hardware and a different kind of set of of details on pricing and subscription. So we're just in this cycle right now. Um, and uh, for a lot of these hobbyist tools that are becoming, uh, that companies are going to try to make more mainstream in various ways, I think we're just going to keep going through this cycle. So I, I'm also just not surprised that we got to this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to our, uh, let's move on to pop culture. Snyder Cut. Hashtag Snyder Cut. So, full disclosure, I have not watched the full Snyder Cut yet. It dropped on HBO Max at midnight Pacific last night. Uh, I, I threatened to do it over Slack to you guys, and I got through 45 minutes before I started passing out, and I was like, I, I can't do this. So I, be <laughs> I believe my response verbatim to you was good luck with that. Um, mostly because it was dropping at midnight and you're I like, know. I'm going to watch a four hour movie starting at midnight. I didn't like, start till 2 a.m. because I was, I was getting work done. So it's like it was way too ambitious. But I did want to at least start it to 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 see, you know, how how much was different just from the opening. Because the reviews actually came out uh, earlier this week. There was a, the whole social media embargo and largely mostly positive. I think Forbes was one of that didn't didn't like it. Um, and the curiosity is where this where I stand with this movie. I'm, I'm there's I'm less hyped you about it. Wreck, right. Yeah, you I, I watch the you're, you're, you're rubberneck in the car crash as you drive by. You want to see how bad it can be. I, 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 I want I want to I want it's 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 like I want to do the, the comparison. I want to do the mental. I want to see you're getting a glimpse not only into, yes, Zack Snyder's full creative vision in all its four by three IMAX XX ratio, four hour, you know, glory. But you're also uh, by seeing this final thing, you're also it closes the loop on all the intrigue about the circumstances in which the original movie, the theatrical cut was re-edited, what was newly written, what was reshot and just from a pure production process of like you know yeah. wh what did they shoot what did they reshoot um it, it, it helps close the door on, on the kind of the the amorphous you know mediocre movie that was the justice league 2017 theatrical cut mediocre but, wow that's gracious of you um my oh go ahead quiche i was gonna say did you say it's four by three it's four. Well, I mean, I, I, see, this what? is something that I, I I didn't realize people didn't know this. Uh, I was almost half IMAX. expecting it to be in black and white. Oh, he shot it in IMAX. Oh no, that's going to look terrible at home. But he didn't shoot the whole movie in IMAX. So there are some scenes I could tell are even just cut to four by three. Uh, you know, shot in thirty five mil or shot digitally, however however they shot it. Uh, but some there are some scenes that you know. I think do make use of the full four by three aspect ratio, but for this home video, essentially for the streaming release, the only version you can watch right now is the four by three version because it's also being released in theaters and IMAX theaters. And that's the full creative vision. In fact, they're going back to Batman V Superman and there are certain scenes in that, that they're expanding to four by three they're showing you oh, more of the more top martha. and bottom martha martha look, look i'm gonna make a i'm gonna, I'm gonna make a i'm gonna give a controversial statement that's gonna really enamor me to the youtube audience i think that if it weren't for that martha scene at the end of batman versus superman that would be viewed as a mediocre to okay movie instead of straight garbo I think I think yeah. Martha gets a the Martha scene gets a bad rap. I, I think it's a Dude. scene that would have played perfectly well in a comic book, reading it on the page, uh, but it is too clever. Maybe. It thinks it's it's too clever by more than half, 
and yeah. it's overwrought because the movie takes itself so seriously that yeah, by the time it. you get to that moment, um, you're it being the, the 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 thing that's supposed to relieve the tension. In fact, it just makes you laugh. People, the I, whole theater laughed when I saw it on opening night. Like when an opening night theater laughs at a serious moment, you you know you have issues. Yeah. I've actually come around on the Snyder Cut in this way. Look, I'm not excited about a four by three watching on my home TV. I'm not excited about a four hour movie because like it's hard to get excited about Lord of the Rings in four hours in the extended cut. And I love that movie. The, this is going to be a lot better than what we saw before. It just will. But there's no uh, way it can't be, Kishore. Yeah. Well, also, Josh Whedon, proven himself to be a garbage human. Um, all the stories about what happened to Ray Fisher that have mm -hmm. come out. Um, I'm excited for Zack Snyder, who seems to be so well regarded by the actors, uh, to get a version of this film out that's more complete and interesting. Now, that, but the thing is, like, even though it'll be better, it's also going nowhere. Like, the whole point of this movie and the Snyder vision for this movie is to set up a larger universe that includes, like, dark side and includes like a larger landscape for them to operate in that is going nowhere this universe to me is dead uh, because of the box office failures of these movies so you're just sort of watching the culmination of that universe in this movie and if this universe means something to you i think you're going to get a lot of enjoyment out of this and i think it'll be a lot better i just personally am not excited about watching a four-hour movie Look, it's two two movies in one. You can watch it vertically. You can watch two TVs above one above each the other, and then you put it across both of those, and you watch it on two nights. It's like four movies. You, you can also crop in, right? Uh, in your TV, most TVs, modern TVs have zoom settings that let you, you zoom oh, in, and and, and, and uh, you know on HBO Max, which is it is broadcast, it is being streaming at 4K or right? 4K Dolby. You're still getting if you crop in uh, approximately a 1080 video signal. You, Here's a big long shot of everybody's chests. That's uh, exactly what what I'm looking <laughs> yeah, for the, in this night. All cut. top of foreheads being cut off and, yeah. and bottom of mouths being cut off for those for those up close. Straight scenes. back to VHS pan and scans. I mean, at least pan and scan did the actual panning, right? The, the pan left and right, and here there's no smart AI way to to pan up and down and reframe, you know, for for widescreen. And I hope there's a there probably won't be there'll, there'll probably be a widescreen edit version, a fan edit version. Uh, they'll they'll come out to fill your TV, but I was shocked. I have a big TV, and it you know four by three makes it look like a small TV because you're just losing every, you know, the black bars and the the screen real estate on left and right is gone. I'm I'm glad it doesn't have like a big advertisement on the left and right side though. Right, you are watching hashtag Snyder Cut. Right, look, here's your social media moment. Forty million dollars back somehow. Seventy million dollars. This, this is one of those weird things. Like I hope it's successful for Zack Snyder who went through a lot. Um, like losing a child, all of those things. I hope it's successful from that stand. And I hope it's not successful because I don't want this to become a trend where it's like, I'm going to recut this movie into a longer edition and stream it and pour money into it. Like, I don't, I don't think it I want to see that trend. Absolutely is going to be a trend. It absolutely. You know, the, 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 the hashtag stuff. Yes. It's a, it's a, you could say it's a unique circumstance in that a movie was cut, but it happens all the time. I mean, you have the the the, the people who push for the fans that push for the Snyder cut are now have pivoted over to David Ayer's and pushing for uh, David Ayer's cut of Suicide Squad. And you know what? They may feel like they're sticking it to the man and the studio here, and 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 getting and, and getting the directors back from studio meddling, but. The studio doesn't care about canon. The studio doesn't care about the, if they can release another version of the movie and, and the bean counters do the math and say, we can pay X amount to do this version and make X amount back with new DVD sales and Blu-ray sales and streaming sales and subscriptions and merchandise. Hell Sweet yeah, they'll toys, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, there's no reason they're not going to, I mean, they, they've done this with, you know, WB has done this with uh, the, the Richard Donner cut for Superman 2. How, how how many copies of Blade Runner do you guys own? I mean, you could buy one. You could buy a briefcase that has all seven copies two. in one, yeah. right? So, like, how they, many copies of Brazil do you own? I, 
I, I just want them to let the Snyderverse die. Hopefully, hopefully he used this as an opportunity to like put a bow on the thing, finish it off by killing off all the characters. No, no, and, no, no, no. You know, just they walk they away are leaving the, the door open. Now, WB has, I think all the wording is that, that you know, w, there's no way AT&T, Warner Brothers, HBO wants to spend yeah, $200 million making another Snyderverse movie. But those characters and the actors are living on in like the Flash movie is going to have Ezra Miller and, and Ben Affleck's coming back for that. There's going to be a trickling of this, you know, with the, the Suicide Squad, James Gunn, that uses technically Snyderverse characters with Harley Quinn. Uh, so it's not dead yet, but I don't think we're going to get a Justice League 2 in the way that, you know, it was originally planned. Two Justice, two League. Ooh, there you go. Uh, speaking of HBO, though, uh, HBO Max did announce that the, coming in June, there's going to be a version of HBO Max that will have ad supported tier so uh, no subscription this is weird hbo has always been as a service pure hbo uh, a a premium you pay that 15 dollars a month to get access to their shows uh, but as they're seeing you know peacock hulu paramount plus come out with ad supported versions even some that you even pay have to pay to get access to the ad supported version uh, they see a long tail opportunity to get money and get more subscribers i think they just hit 70 million subscribers which is in short of disney's 100 million uh, but uh what these ad f- the ad supported versions will not get is the day and date releases the uh the simultaneous premieres for the theatrical films like you know godzilla vs kong dune the matrix space jam that's coming out on hbo uh, which you know that may only be for this year but they're seeing how how that plays are they going to call it HBO Men? I mean, that's that's the joke yeah. right there, right? There you go, right nailed it right in the head. Uh, to me, this is Disney and Netflix are doing so well; they don't need to do this. The other services are struggling, and they need as many forms of revenue as they can get to recoup the massive amount of money they've put into these platforms. Everyone's that's vying what it for to me for for, for Three. volume for for second place to Netflix. That's what's going everybody, on. Right everybody's now. fighting for third is what I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, Paramount Plus is one of them. And I don't think this is coming out on Paramount Plus, but there's a big crowdfunding campaign uh, to do a documentary on the Star Trek Voyager series. I think I, I think from the same people who did the Deep Space Nine one, or at least in that same vein. Is that right? And they just reached a Which milestone. Very good. Where they just got seven six hundred thousand in funding, uh, so they're expanding the scope of the project. I don't know if they're doing any HD remasters of scenes from Voyager, but you know, I I, I look forward to a a really good Voyager doc that does the show justice because I think that show has been better received over time. Is this the one where the cast will all just slam Rick Bergman constantly? I mean, this wasn't wasn't this one he? Yeah, anyway. Do you think there's an outside chance that they'll use my wife's version of the Voyager theme song in this uh, in this documentary? Bum, 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 she, bum, yeah, she bum, put bum, words bum, to the theme. Bum, bum. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I mean, speaking of HD versions, there have been fans that have done 4K recreations of the Voyager show opening because that's just the CG, you know. Well, some of the model back models back then, but they've done like a CG recreation that looks wow. pitch perfect. Uh, and in 4K, that opening. I mean, Jerry Goldsmith's themes are are uh, they're iconic, right? All of his Star Trek yeah. themes. Um, so you know, you, you got to love that. And when he stopped doing them, when he passed away, and there was no Star Trek Enterprise theme from him, you know, that that, that was it was very a sad. Long road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tangentially related to Voyager, we know that Kate Mulgrew is coming back into the role of Catherine Janeway for Star Trek Prodigy unconfirmed how so yet hmm. uh, Star Trek Prodigy is the Nickelodeon animated CG animated Star Trek show a little, aimed a little toward, more toward kids but it's about a group of youthful aliens who happen upon a derelict Federation ship uh, and hmm. somehow Kate Mulgrew Janeway is involved now the prevailing fan theory before they've announced anything is that that derelict ship will actually be Voyager will be a decommissioned Ooh. Voyager, which last I heard uh, in Star Trek canon was turned into a museum after it went back to Earth, you know, stripped for its Borg uh, nanoprobe parts and then turned as the parked in the Presidio 
uh, or Golden Gate Park, I forget what it is, as a as a walk-in museum. Uh, but uh, the idea, if it pans out, is that this it might be that they find Voyager, a version of Voyager, and Janeway is there as a an emergency command hologram. It's like a space. It's a space camp sitch. Yeah, space camp. That's right. Yeah, yeah, for the kids. I mean, I like the I like Lower Decks. I'm a big fan of that show. So Lower Decks is great. I, I more more Star Trek. Um, happy for that universe to expand. Yeah. Uh, we talked on the podcast uh, a couple months ago now about the last. Remember this? The last blockbuster that is operating in Bend, Oregon, that did like a you, uh, paired up with Airbnb, so you can sleep over at that blockbuster as a way to make money uh, for them to raise money during the pandemic. Uh, well, that blockbuster is still around. But I this this past week we watched the documentary about that blockbuster, that last blockbuster store, which is on Netflix, <laughs> streaming on Netflix. Uh, I think it's totally worth watching. It's a wonderful nostalgia trip. Uh, the fact I know the the easy joke is that this is you know Netflix flexing, having killed blockbuster. But the the one interesting you know uh, one of the interesting takeaways is that. Blockbuster failed not because of Netflix or other circumstances, which they, they interview the previous CFOs of Blockbuster about, you know, why that business failed. But there was that whole, you know, chain of Blockbusters in Alaska, the last three there, those went out of business. And the, the sole one remaining, it's an officially licensed Blockbuster. It isn't just like a video store that they, they put the name Blockbuster on it. They still pay Dish Network, which owns the Blockbuster brand, a licensing fee to use it. And the craziest thing, they their their over the counter checkout system machines are still those old like nice. Pentium what? systems. <laughs> yes, nice. Yes, they have not. They're they're not using laptops. Like there's a scene where the manager of this Blockbuster store goes into their storeroom and they bought up all the old stock of old computers and she's taking apart, unscrewing these dusty old computers. To take out the to, to salvage the proprietary cards needed to run the inventory management system on their blockbuster store. Look, now I'm sold on this it, documentary. Yeah, I, I'm I'm ba- like that is amazing. And B, like the moment that place goes under, it should become a museum, right? Like we should just turn that into like what the '90s were like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Speaking of Blockbuster Netflix, uh, Netflix has started cracking down on family password sharing. Not for all users, but some people have noticed pop-ups that say you should maybe find your own Netflix account. And it's maybe they're looking for IP addresses, but you know, technically you're allowed to share accounts within your household and how they've defined household has been loose. Uh, they're, they, they may require, and this is absolutely something I could see all the streaming services do, they may require uh, location services um, tracking. So, you know, within the same region, within the same city, maybe within the same actual IP for people to actually share passwords. The, well, the, yeah, the days of password sharing willy nilly are probably going to go away. Hulu and uh, YouTube TV both require location access. Um, if you're not on a desktop machine and um, it, as, as someone who has had problems with somebody hacking my Netflix account, um, I've never shared the Netflix password. They are not set up to deal with password problems that aren't related to someone sharing their password with their roommate. Like yeah. it is their their first answer whenever you're like, hey, my Netflix account was pa- hacked and you guys keep giving it, keep resetting my password and giving the new one to this person who calls you are, hey, don't share your password. And it is it is maddening to the point that I almost canceled Netflix. Like it is, it, it is. Is it going to like a Will Smith of West Philadelphia? <laughs> That would be hilarious. Something if that's like look. log in West Philadelphia. No, come on. I got in one come little on, fight. Bel Air. No. And, and my wife got scared. She said, we're turning off Netflix because <laughs> it's annoying you. Uh, some, I mean, someone's job at this streaming company is to find out how much shrinkage technically, what, the, what, the, what they're losing due to just password account sharing, the open secret of everyone sharing accounts. And, you know, at some point they'll make the calculation that they can make 10% more revenue, you know, growth just by locking people out and, and geofencing accounts and they'll do it. You know, it's well within their right to do it. Uh, and everyone once, I think once one falls, every, you know, all the streaming services will follow suit. 
Those, um, those are my favorite. Am I the asshole posts is when somebody breaks up with their partner and like they're sitting there watching them on Netflix, watch like eight, eight, seven out of eight episodes of Queen's Gambit and then oh change God. the password before they watch episode eight. And yeah. Or, you know, if you're if you're an asshole, you start episode, you you like you skip forward an episode. So when they click resume, they've missed an episode oh. or, or you know, the autoplay spoils something for them. Yeah, there, there's there's ways you can get around that. OK, uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want you to know again that this is only a test. This week is made possible with support from Storyblocks. We all know that video is the most effective way to capture someone's attention, but the storytellers of today are challenged with creating more video content at higher quality than ever before. Thankfully, Storyblocks makes it easy to keep up with the growing demands of modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and stop sacrificing your vision to its time, budget, or resources. Every creator should try a Storyblocks membership. And with affordable subscriptions, you can stay on budget while telling the best version of your story. Storyblocks is an ever-growing library of over one million high quality stock assets including 4k footage after effects and premiere pro templates music images sound effects and more the assets are royalty free and with their unlimited all access plan you get unlimited downloads of everything in the storyblocks library and if you're a member of a large creative team or marketing agency even or media organization storyblocks has your back with comprehensive coverage of your entire for your entire company that enables you to distribute wherever and whenever learn more and subscribe today at story Storyblocks.com slash only a test. Once again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. You know, it's a year of milestones. We're officially one year into working from home. I'm thinking about what I did last year. I'm also thinking about what I did two and a half years ago because in two weeks, uh, I'm gonna be. A, I'm a guys. I'm gonna be a father. I'm gonna twice. Be, I know you're it's, twice the father. Either oh, of us are. This is a new frontier, indeed. But it's making me think about what I was doing. You know, two weeks before our kid was born here, and I was playing a lot of Red Dead Redemption. I think it was the last full game that I played. But I'm not doing a lot of that this time. I mean, I mean, obviously having a two-year-old puts the damper on that. But if I was to be playing games, Will, I would be turning to you for recommendations. And you're here this week. Tell tell me about Eco. What is what is Eco? So Eco is not a new game. Eco has been around for a long time. It started as an education as educational software and was one of the early Kickstarters. Um, but it's designed to it was designed to originally show middle schoolers how interconnected technology and all the products we are and how many people touch how much labor goes into like the simplest consumer goods that we buy. So the people who made this um, had made a, a kind of low, low fi version of the game. And then they ran a Kickstarter to, to, to ratchet up the graphics and I think Minecraft it up. I, I I'm not familiar with that part of the story as much. The upshot is it's a game that simulates labor in a Minecraft like voxely universe. And you have these professions you have a, you have a, a massive tech tree like you do in a survival game that requires massive interconnected labor between all the people on the server so there's like you know there's hunters and gatherers and farmers and millers and potters and mason people and steel workers and miners and depending on how you set up the server you can get 50 or 100 people in there at a time and everybody works together and and the 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 pitch is you have X number of days, usually it's like 30 days, I think is the default, to level up your society from a pre-agrarian hunter-gatherer society until you can defeat a meteor. Um, you build enough lasers to blow up a meteor that's, that's going to crash into the planet. And you have to do it. it. They also model things like CO2 emissions and water pollution and air pollution and things like that. So you have to do it without destroying the ecology of the planet. And it models things like how the pollution is impacting biomes and how deforestation is uh, impacting the animals in the floor, the flora and the fauna in the world. So it, it ended I, like a friend of mine, uh, a, a, a PUBG streamer, Choco Taco, uh, asked if I wanted to come play in this eco server. I was like, oh, I'll check that out. That sounds like it'd be fun. And it's it's at the same time, it has prox voice chat. So 
like it's become this weird community thing where you're sitting like you're in your mind and somebody comes by your place oh. and they're like, hey, Will, you around? I'm like, yeah, I'll come up and you have a chat about what's going on and like what people need and what people need you to be working on. And it's become this really like as the game is starting to wind down because we're going to destroy the meteor on Friday night. Um, as the game winds down, it's kind of it's become a little like melancholy because it's like this. We've reached the end of the, this world. And like people aren't logging in as much because like their stuff is done, but it's been, it's, it's, it's kind of in between like going to camp and playing rust, like, like where rust is the toxic end of the spectrum and going to camp is the, the positive end of the spectrum. It's, it's been a really, it's unlike any game I've ever played and it's made me appreciate, it's made me look at the world a little differently, which is the, kind of the nicest thing I think I can say about a video game. Nice. It, it wasn't Chaco a former teacher too. So like is his exposure to the game from the educational uh, background? So uh, Chaco, I think uh, his, his history is that he, he was um, like a Lego, like he used Lego to teach robotics and building and stuff like that. He was one of mm -hmm. like, in one of those kind of like, not necessarily teacher teacher, but like he was one of the people that came to schools and ran Lego, Lego classes and stuff like that for you. Um, and uh yeah, it's it's been it's really fascinating. It, may, it makes me like I've kind of been thinking about starting up some out school stuff to run. I, I'm looking at how to set up the server to do like I would love to do out school for like 12 year olds to figure to to do this where for it's like where you have like an hour a day or two hours a day on the server or something like that. Um, and I got to see if the server will work that way because I think that would be fascinating to run for kids. It would be really fun. How long did you say it takes to get through a whole psycho? Cycle? Well, so, okay. So when you play with a bunch of like professional streamers and like power gamers, we probably could have done it in about nine days at the settings, the default settings. I think if we were doing it again, like you can adjust the variables. So you can adjust like how fast people level up and how fast they gain access to new professions and things like that. And like, I have, I think seven professions at this point, which is, which is probably too many. Like we should have made that part harder so that people had to work together more and do more trade and stuff like that. Um, but like you establish governments, you establish currency, you can establish like company script, you can establish government backed currency, you can establish currency tied to a resource in the world. You can establish offices and give them roles. You can establish like there's right now there's a tax. We People were chopping down trees and leaving the stumps, which causes pollution. So, so they establish a tax where you get charged a money when you chop down a tree and you get that exact money back when you chop the stump out, like it's, it's, it's this, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. The thing that they've built. And it's, it's, it's really, really neat. So yeah. uh, for a second there, I was thinking you're heading towards like cryptocurrency, the game based on that description Look. of creating your own currency and managing the environmental impact of it. I, I think that if eco did cryptocurrency, it would be proof of work stake, not proof of work probably. So <laughs> And it's another one of those sandboxes where they've built in enough of the simulation levers and the social, you know, uh, uh, foundations to to let people just build out their own experiences and have good memories there. Well, and, and, and yeah, to give you context, like I, I did potting. That was my main profession. So I'm making bricks and making making, you know, clay pots and chairs and stuff. And I started with a wooden shovel that I could scoop one one Minecraft cube voxel of clay at a time. Like two days ago, I got access to a little bobcat with a bucket front end loader, and I can get like 160 at a time or something like that. And it is it is the best example of the video game power fulfillment fantasy, because like if you've if you've emptied a cave of clay one shovel full at a time, going from that to being able to scoop up thousands, you know, hundreds of them at a time is is uh, is is really cool. It's really fun. All right. Eco, nothing to do with dolphins, a nope, labor simulator, echo. and uh, I'll tell I'll tell Danica about the labor simulator. That's that, that, that yeah. Feels it's, like she, look, it's she's going to prepare her for this baby thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the other big game is Valheim. I know it's very popular. I'm not going to we're not on time to dive in that. But Eco or Valheim, if you had to play only one, I don't know what the public server situation is like on Eco. Valheim is you can set up a small server and play with like 10 people. It's basically Viking Minecraft with with like some souls like combat and Skyrim souls slash Skyrim like combat. It's it's a really neat game. People I, I that, will but... say Valheim's one of those dangerous World of Warcraft type games like you will come out the other side like three years older um, it, because it is so addictive. The, the mods on my Twitch stream have been playing Valheim on their own server and they've made 
some amazing like Viking longhouses and stuff like that. It's really cool. It's a perfect kind of game to watch people play too. Perfect for for yeah. Twitch streaming. Um, all right, and you know what? These games are you're going to be playing on PC because PC Intel, sorry, Intel systems are the games that, according to Justin Long, you guys see this, uh, along with Intel's release this week of their 11th gen desktop chipsets, still on 14 nanometer process, uh, they started a new ad campaign with. Justin Long coming back. He's no longer a Mac. He's not quite a PC, but he's an Intel. He's an Intel guy now. I'm shaking my head. It's a weird campaign. Like, why would you reference somebody else's 15 year old, 20 year old campaign? Well, money and <laughs> relevance, but maybe, maybe, <laughs> like, let's talk about why they're running this campaign period, right? This is Intel, not Microsoft doing this, which is why it's strange, uh, but Apple with Apple moving with to their own off of Intel chips, so their own M series ARM based uh, chips for their uh, desktop and laptop systems, right? It's given Intel some stress about it, and they want to make the position of don't, don't try a Mac. Right, even though that feels like that should be Microsoft's job to do, like why spend the money pointing out that Apple is phasing out your chips on their computers when that's not even something that people really knew about when they went to buy a Mac or a PC? Yeah, it's it's a weird like I don't I don't understand. I mean, I understand why somebody would think this is a good idea, but it seems like referencing an incredibly successful ad campaign from twenty years ago is not the way to go about letting people know that their Macs won't run your old software especially when that's not even really the case. And if their whole message is these are the things you can do on, you know, a Windows-based system when their whole thing is gaming touchscreens and whatever. And yes, Intel they make robust chipsets and with, you know, great USB and Thunderbolt support and and all the stuff they pack in, uh, a lot of people are just also buying maybe AMD-based systems now and maybe that's yeah. where they should focus on or maybe their fab processes. Uh I'm sure that's something they're well aware of and their new leadership, uh, those changes might not come for, you know, a year or two or three years because the things they're launching now have been in development for the past four or five years. Well, and, and they killed the 3D memory, the NAND stuff too, like the 3D, the 3D um, high density NAND flash that works, you know, the Optane stuff. The, yeah, they their, sold their off that division. Microns. Yep. Yeah, they sold off that division, Micron selling their fab. Like that, like they, they're, they're doing some interesting consolidation. I, I just, it just, like I see Justin Long talking about computers and I think about how cool Macs were in like 2007. <laughs> they, they should bring back, uh, Hodgman. Well, n Apple already brought back Hodgman for their keynote. And so this, oh, you know, that's right. it's too, it's too recent, but they should bring back that actress who did the, you know, the, 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 the who, who did the I'm the PC or you no? Know, I went to the printer and it was like, t -t 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 -t, you know, the, 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 all the people from those like old campaigns, <laughs> right? All, all those Apple <laughs> campaigns. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not very good. Um, Apple is discontinuing the full HomePod, too expensive. You know, this feels like a, one of the last vestiges of the Johnny Ive era of let's focus on design, make this high end product and charge a lot of money for it without really, considering maybe what the market can bear and uh, the competition in that space and people being totally fine paying a hundred dollars for speakers from uh, a Sonos or a, or sorry, uh, from Amazon or, you know, Google home even, uh, and not want to spend $400 or 350 on, on a home pod. Uh, so only the home pod mini, which has been wildly successful, maybe just by contrast because of the, the pricing. Uh, so get your full size home pods now before they're fully out of, Stock and then the last thing in tech, you know, you mentioned mining. Kishore, uh, Nvidia had started cracking down on the, some of their 3000 series cars, I believe the 3060, uh, for mining by disabling in the drivers the ability to run those hashes. Uh, but one of their dev drivers got accidentally released, which reverted that functionality back, and there's no going back from that. So, Oops. oh no. Yeah, so uh, some of the 3060s, if you have 3060s, you can find uh, on the internet drivers that will let you get back into your ETH mining. Okay, I guess I'll have to go down, go down and replant part of the Amazon rainforest to make up for it, <laughs> this driver release. It's cool. Yeah, well, you, you're, put you're, more solar panels up in Denmark. It'll be fine. You're, you're on a 3080, Kishore, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you you could do whatever you want. I think you've paid enough. The, the they're gonna. I'm folding proteins over here. Oh, are that's, you? 
No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Look, how much Ethereum that, can I mine I an be. hour with this thing? I, I need, I need, like, if I want to make some fast cash, is Ethereum mining on a 3080 a good strategy or not oh, so much? That, that is not a question that I, I, I want to even have an answer to. Uh, it, it depends on the day, and you'll have to ask Gunther, is my answer to that. Okay, okay. Uh, let's move on to our last segment. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. We actually got. I got to jump. Have a good jump. VR minute. Thank you, Kishore. We'll see you later. Uh, Will, we got two big pieces of VR news that dropped. We're we're what? back. We're back in the hardware. This feels like 2015 again. We got PlayStation hardware VR news and Oculus VR news. Which one do you want to hear first? I want to hear the Oculus. Have you hold on? Have you talked about the face tracker yet? No. Well, last week, yeah. So HTC announced a face tracker. Okay. Uh, have you for, seen it? Uh, not in person. I've only seen videos, and I, I know a bunch of people have tested it. Uh, but that's for the the Vive Pro, not the Cosmos. Yeah. And um, you really, they're they're targeting. I mean, I'm sure it's something that's interesting to you with all the, the yeah. tracking stuff you've done before. Um, but it's calibrated, so they've run their recognition systems through you know neural networks to do the best type of with stereo video the best um analysis and and, and, and hmm. skeletal rigging of you know a face tracker to graft onto like digital vloggers it's for people who are in like vr chat and and doing full avatar based performances well, and, which is really big in over in asia right now well it's i mean starting here too the vtuber thing is kind of taking off in a way that's that's i was surprised by here i i we looked at that years ago and i expected it to go someplace in asia and it never happened here but it seems like it's maybe going to happen here too anyway uh sorry but and and, and you know compared to the off the shelf like people could buy phones and and use the the uh the the uh, ir um you know the the the, uh, the cameras. FaceTime depth cameras, exactly. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, Intel RealSense stuff and, and again, approximations of that. But, you know, this has the... Well, the fact that it's designed to work with just the bottom half of your face is the interesting thing. Because, like, yeah. uh, on... It, it, we When we were doing face tracking stuff at Foo, we were doing... Uh, we were having a voice actor sit in front of the, the depth camera and then having a body actor do the body movements at the same time. And, and like, that worked okay, but it's not ideal, obviously. Yeah. Um, and and it being locked to the headset is important, right? Because you yeah. can't put, you know, unless you're mounting the phone to the headset or you're mounting, you know, uh, you had some way to calibrate. Like that's where you're going to get the accuracy. Although I, I think one question we asked last week was why why did it need two two cameras? Like, is is stereo that important for the stuff? Uh, so it depends on how they're doing it. I I don't I haven't looked at the docs to see what they're doing and what they're providing back. Um, the the in in our experience, the 2D doing it with the 2D camera is much more expensive computationally on whatever the host machine mm. is. So either you have to have a big GPU that you can devote a fair amount of that to the to the um, a, a fair amount of the compute section. Like a 3080, obviously is fine, but like a 1080, you might have a little bit of a uh, it might impact your frame rates a little bit. Would be my guess. Yeah. So the depth camera gives you a little bit more stuff. And since the slam, since there's slam acceleration is easy to do in hardware now. Like you can get a nice mesh out of that, probably with my guess, or or bones, probably. So uh, South by Southwest is going on this week, the virtual South by Southwest, and um, there's going to be, I think, a uh, uh, presentation by one of the Oculus VPs. But the announcement came out online uh, before that, ahead of that, and it'll be out by the time you listen to this podcast. But they showed off their research prototypes for their next gen VR controllers, which are. Uh, based on the Control Labs wristband, neural wristband technologies they acquired back in, I think, 2019, I want to say. Nice. And so these are wristbands that read your neural signals and can do, you know, pose detection, hand tracking, essentially, without optical sensors. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a hybrid system um, of using, you know, the, uh, the, those neural-based uh, signals combined with, you know, an optical um uh, recognition that they're currently using and the inside out tracking, but they think that these wristbands will be the way you interface with VR, potentially AR systems going forward. They think you can get millimeter precise pose accuracy just from the signals that you wear on this wristband. The wristbands look kind of look like, you know, Black Widow's 
Black Widow's gauntlets. They're like these like bars, sweat, like sweatbands thickness, uh, or bigger than that. About sweatband, I think thicker than that. They they look like vertical, like long, you know, Kit Kat. Think about Kit Kat bars wrapped around okay. your wrist um, on okay. a wristband. And in the in the videos, it's not doesn't need to be tight right against your wrist. Somewhere in the forearm, like halfway in your forearm. But interesting. I think they're you know taking these signals, running through learning algorithms, running through neural networks to improve the accuracy, and they think there's a path forward here for it to be millimeter accurate. Uh, haptics was a big question for for Jeremy for this stuff, and uh, in their blog they talked about pulling out a pair of light, soft, lightweight gloves that would give you actual haptic feedback uh, that would not be used for tracking, but just for the feedback part. I mean, the next phase is just to to use electric shocks to stimulate the nerves, the sense nerves, rather than measuring the the, the motion nerves, and uh, you know, just send the stimulus directly back. I mean, just, just stab right into the back of the neck, right? Just plug right yeah, into well, the matrix. Maybe not, maybe not. Maybe not that. Let's not go that far. Uh, but this is very interesting. This does. I mean, they, they have no timeline for when this is going to come out, but this is what they're working on, and. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it makes sense. It, it, it makes sense as a, as a bold step. I think uh, physical controllers make a lot of sense for video games. But if you're talking about interacting with you know, virtual interfaces, with augmented reality interfaces, um, you, know, you, don't you don't need the haptic feedback. Or you can get it with you know, the haptic spread on your body, you know, tapping, tapping your palm, pinching your fingers, or you know, all, all the other places that you can build in haptics well so the big question for me on something like this is is do you have like fidelity to do something like typing right is it fast enough and reliable enough that you can mimic a physical keyboard and type at a comparable speed stuff stuff like that and um like doing <laughs> wide sweeping pinch and grab gestures like like tom cruise like the classic tom cruise minority report example i kind of don't care about yeah because we can do that with depth cameras pretty easily right now i i need if you don't have fine motor control it's not interesting. And I'm also really curious whether this is coming out of the Seattle research group, like the, the, the deep, the deep time think tank where they're working on stuff, you know, five years, air quote, five years in the future, or if this is something that's actively like in, in the, let's make this a product team down South. I feel like it's a, let's make a product, but tied to, you know, they've already said they're going to do the Ray-Ban style glasses and then AR after that. It's in probably yeah. tied tied to that. And the data they'll get if this comes out for, for VR ahead of time will refine the AR controllers. I think, you know, we talked about the, the minority report being such an anchor um, collectively in our pop culture about uh, touch interfaces. But that ergonomically, I think any, all those UX designers would say that that's not how people want to interface because you don't want to be, you don't want to have hands down, arms out for long periods of time to interface. Uh, you'd rather do the small micro movements. The reason a, well, a mouse works is you have so much more fine motor control in your wrists and in your fingers and, and dexterity there uh, that you're it's an abstraction, right? You're basically using a motion control pointer, but extrapolating very fine bits of motor control with a DPI of a mouse tracker to big, big swaths of movement. And I think that graphs on directly with physical control with where, you know, it's, it's like in children of men, you're doing your, your hands in a resting pose and you're doing very small micro movements to control. And that's still, that's an abstraction for text because the direct, you know, the, the, the shortcut and the direct connection would be thinking of a word and thinking of a sentence and then um, getting that directly on screen rather than typing out with a, a virtual keyboard. The I virtual keyboard just makes sense because that's what we've been trained to do. I don't think I want the direct connection where every word I think ends up on the screen. I think that would be an absolute disaster because I, you know, like you think about, you think about the process of writing for me, at least, I mean, everybody's brain's probably different, but I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about what I want to say and I work through it in my head like five times. And then I get to the point that I'm like, okay, this is good. My fingers do the rest. And, and but that that's because we are trained that way where yeah. we can think and then we you know, at some subconscious level or conscious level, we decide to pull the trigger on on typing that word, and the physical interface of that is the gate. But if they can have that gate be just mental, right? It's like in the movie Her, yeah. and you know the version of the, the, of the future they envisioned was verbal dictation of of text. 
right? So yeah. when uh, when Joaquin Phoenix was like writing, you know, whatever letters, right? He was just dictating out loud, and we're like, no one wants to dictate their sentences like, or their essays, but in that world, that's just how people started thinking. Just rewiring the way you think about how you how you uh, communicate. I think it's really fascinating that even what Minority Report came out in like 97 or something, 2001 or 2001 or two. Yeah. Okay. So it's 20 years old this year ish. And, and like Tom Cruise put on wristbands to control that interface. Right. So, so he put on gloves, he put on gloves with light, they're light tracking gloves. Right. So they're track with, with uh, presumably there were IR detectors, which is exactly how so many of those, you know, uh, motion tracking gloves uh, work in the early days. Wow. I mean, it's, it's fascinating that we're working on, like, is, are, are we looking, are we looking at the form factors because of the way these movies represented this stuff 20 years ago? Or are we looking at these form factors because they're the best way to do it? It's probably, I mean, it's, it's obviously loop. the latter. It, it's, but, a, it's the latter, but those movies were informed by, yeah. uh, those movies were informed by the research and uh, the, the futurists that, you know, come out of the same places in many cases as where these researchers come from um Fascinating. but you also look at you know the visual medium of television and movies and needing to communicate things in a way that's visually interesting you know i go back to the star trek pad right you know we have do we have tablets do we have ipads because you know in star trek people picked up pads with scrolling interfaces you know maybe that was uh, just as a convenient prop thing um and they had those they have laptops and and, and stuff like that and and but there's there's logical reason to do that uh, but there's a lot of shortcuts that, you know, the visual storytelling told that, you know, people just like, like, like the holodeck is another perfect example. Right? Yeah. Like, does that oh, even yeah. make sense to do a room that way? No. You know, you're the, even though we want the idea of the holodeck, it, it's probably going to be that we're all in just isolated tracked spaces and not in a shared physical space to do a holodeck type experience. Yeah, we all lock into our booths and you have, poor guy comes out and has to. You know, anyway, we don't need to get into that. But yeah. Um, and then last bit before we wrap up the show, PlayStation Sony announced and showed off uh, images of their next-gen VR PS5 controller. So uh, it's on the PlayStation blog. They had put out a press release a couple weeks ago saying that PSVR version 2 or the follow-up is coming to PS5. There's developer units are going out this year, uh, but they finally they, and they, they hinted at a new controller interface. The images, you know what? They look a lot like the Oculus Touch style controllers. You know, this is the neutral pose with you know, a trigger, a grip button. Uh, the trigger, the analog trigger, will have the PS5 style haptic, so the adaptive triggers, okay. which people love on the PS5. There's going to be haptic feedback. Uh, it looks like the biggest thing revealed here, though, is probably that it'll use an inside out tracking system on the headset to recognize this because there's going to be a ring that wraps around your wrist as you hold these controllers. Uh, that would not make sense if that was being tracked from an external PSI style camera. It would make more sense if it was a, a headset based internal camera that track these I, I don't i don't i don't think the idea that they're doing an inside out tracking is a surprise i mean the, yeah. the, if they I, I would be more surprised if they weren't doing inside out tracking at this point given how well that works on on quest and the windows mr stuff and everything else that uses it um you got thumbsticks you got buttons you got your you know your squares your triangles your x's and your o's you got your share button you know grip button there's no shoulder button uh but uh, they did say there would be uh finger touch detection so presumably a capacitive sensing on all those buttons for the pose detection my guess is that the the grip button mimics the the shoulder like the shoulder button is replaced by the grip button would be my guess um, i don't i mean i i kind of wish there was a shoulder button i i like the fact that you know you can have the analog of a playstation controller in a in, in psvr game uh, fully tracked, and maybe the PS5 controller is something you could still use, and that has gyros that allow it to be fully tracked. Uh, but the first PS VR tracked controller externally, and I don't know if this will be a hybrid, you know, outside in and inside out tracking, so you can also get the PS5. What is it? Dual Sense controller, um, also visualize in headset. I was going to say one of the things that's really neat about the way the PS4 VR stuff works is that tracked controller. Like it ends up when you're playing something like Tetris or um, uh, the the little robot game um, Astrobot. Astrobot, yeah, where you can see the control where you, where you look down. Like 
you and I don't need that because we know what buttons are what on the controllers. We've been playing games for 30 years. But when like my daughter or my wife are sitting down and they can't remember which is the circle and which is the square on the PlayStation because they're Nintendo, they're more familiar with the Nintendo or Xbox controller. It is incredibly useful to look down where your hands are and see the buttons and just know, like, not have to think about it and, and have access to those the, that, that feedback immediately. So well, not very just that. user friendly. They're also able to use it as like, morph that controller into things like, you know, a, a fishing rod or have near field interactions where you'd have robots dancing on the controller. Uh-huh. Entirely haptics, it felt it, it put you more in those experiences, um, even without hand, full hand tracking. Like or use it as a way to aim. Like you can shoot stuff out of it in some games. Like it's it's a really neat. It's having. I would before I saw the PS5 PS4 games, I wouldn't have said that the tracked controller is important. And I it's something I miss on PC VR constantly when I'm playing a, a, uh, a controller game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all so right. I hope, I hope they don't get rid of that. I guess is what I'm saying. Me too. Yes, and I don't know. I don't have a PS5, so I don't know if that controller has the the sensors for it or the, the light I, that you would need you know, for an external tracker to see it. I wonder if somebody's aimed an IR camera at it, a, a sure. camera that IR filters at it. Yeah. Hmm. S- send me a oh. PS5 controller and I will aim my I- IR cameras at it. And, and let look, you, know you can't PS5 like. controller. PS5s don't exist, Norm. You can't buy those. That's not a real thing. Ugh. Ugh. Oh, so sad. I don't have either, either of those. Uh, me okay. Either. That does it for the podcast this week. Thank you so much, Will, for jumping oh, on. Pleasure, Anything man. you want to promote? Anything you want to talk about? Well, I mean, you can come maybe watch us destroy a meteor at, at eight o'clock on Friday. Um, there's going to be lasers. They're 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 like we've shifted over from building the stuff to destroy the meteor into building new and novel ways to appreciate destroying the meteor. I think we're going to roll the server back, do it a couple of times, maybe. I don't know. Um, well, you can do that. The, you, can, you, can, real... you can you can actually roll it back and and redo it. Well, so it's like a big ass dedicated server. Yeah. You, like it's just running on somebody's machine someplace. So they they, you know, mash save on the save file bring the server down, load the old one back up and and there you go. Wow. Um, uh, check out the tech pod. We do new episodes every week. It's a single, basically a single topic episode each week. So we don't talk about news or any of that. Occasionally we do, but mostly it's new topics. Um, the last couple of weeks, occasionally we do a ranking, which is gratuitous, but fun. So this, uh, the last, over the last two weeks we ranked, uh, Brad and I ranked uh, uh, the, the, Things that have made PC building easier and or better over the last 20 years, 25 years. Hmm. Ooh. Uh, SATA cables. SATA is definitely one of those. It's on the list. Uh, hold on. Actually, uh, you know what? We might have cut SATA because SATA cables are more convenient than the predecessor. But the but the the actual design of the connector is kind of janky because they um, fall off and they break. How about... Uh, uh, I think. I know it's on Asus motherboards, but I don't know if it's on other motherboards, but the jumper adapter. The Q you, plug? The You plug all the jumpers onto this mm-hmm. block, and then that block goes into the motherboard. That one we talked about. We talked about that for sure. We talked about uh, smooth. You probably are too young to remember this, but before like Cooler Master and Leon Lee and those folks started making nice cases, the the inside of computer cases used to just be stamped metal with really sharp edges. So and a like, removable tray, motherboard tray? Oh, uh, so motherboard trays we didn't talk about, but like holes in cases we did talk about? Yes, yeah, so like, like the, 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 the ability to access the back of the motherboard mm-hmm. from the other side of the case. Well, and, and like running cables and for like running cables or putting CPU coolers on, taking them off, stuff like that we talked about. Uh, we talked about PCI Express is pretty big, it turns out, because like... One slot to rule them all, it turns out, is a really convenient thing. Modular power supply? Uh, modular power supply is right up the, near the top of the list. Yep. Um, it was a fun conversation. Oh, wow. PC uh, we should have you on sometime thumb, to talk thumb about screws. something. We should talk about <laughs> photography or something sure. with you sometime, Norm. Absolutely. Anytime. I know you have a lot of free time uh, right now. Anytime. I'll, I'll bring a baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, that and then the uh, you can find that at techpod.content.town. And then I stream PUBG and Eco right now at uh, Valheim at twitch.tv slash will not that will smith every night pacific time join the discord support will all right in there um cool thank you so much uh for listening and i hope you guys enjoy the snyder cut i'll be watching tonight hey falcon winter soldier also out this week jesus we didn't even talk about that oh really that's this is friday this week yes you can you can switch your services watch four hours of snyder cut and then uh chase it down with 
Falcon and the Winter Soldier at 12 a.m. Pacific. I'm secretly really excited about watching the Snyder Cut. I hope it's good. I mean, it's something. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We'll talk about it another time. Uh, This outro created by Great Job. Looking for new outros. If you want to create an outro, uh, you can always DM it to me or email it to me, norman at tested.com. This one, I believe, may be... PUBG related? Oh no, here we go. Let's take a listen. What? Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it. There is a new um, use Unreal Engine for Swell related. Epic Games announced they have a game coming called Fortnite. Okay. And Fortnite will have, will have a mode that is basically just like Battlegrounds Unknown. Okay. It Unknown Battlegrounds. Down happy. Based on a screenshot. I mean, there's other games like Battleground, um, and it's just like they're just they just did it best, and they're the most successful. I don't, I don't see PUBG having any main competition. <laughs> oh, that's delicious. That's I, delicious. Look, the fact that you call it. What what what? Uh, Kishore ba- called it battlegrounds unknown. Battlegrounds unknown, oh, unknown player battle so player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this Fortnite thing's probably not going to be a yeah, big deal. Who knows? Epic. Yeah. Who knows? Making making games. What is this? Look. Stuff? Between that, COD COD is having cheater problems, so people are sweaty. COD people are coming back to PUBG now, and it's it's exhausting. They're just they're just so aggressive. Like they just always they're they're so angry. They're so angry and fast. Ugh. <laughs> PUBG, PUBG drama. All right, yeah. cool. Thanks, Will. We'll see you later. Bye, Norm. See ya.